All right, so a few years ago, those of you who are fans of Graveyard Cars will recall, we drove up north to Washington. I took my little buddy Chrome Dome, and we went to Washington State because I had heard of a couple of chargers that were sitting in a swampland type of field that could be purchased. I knew that when I left here, based on the description, there wasn't much left of the cars, but they could make potentially good parts cars. So we went up there, and subsequently, we bought those cars. They're coming to get you, Barbara. Buried deep in the Pacific Northwest, one team in Springfield, Oregon, takes on the impossible, finding dead Mopar muscle and bringing it back from the grave. Award-winning master of Mopar, Mark Warman, his cousin, Doug, his daughter, Alyssa, his best friend, Royal, his painter, Will, and the rest of the GYC ghouls are restoring, resurrecting, and recreating some of the fastest, fiercest, and rarest muscle cars on the planet. This is Graveyard Cars. I almost like the picture and the setting more than I do the idea of bringing oh, them back and cleaning them up. Yeah. So when we got there, it was pretty amazing. These cars looked so cool sitting down there in that. And it wasn't a swamp, just to be clear. It just looked like a swamp. The cars were so covered in moss and had been setting for so long. It just, like I say, I like to use the word natural habitat. Because it, sadly, some of these cars, that is their natural habitat these days. When I'm there looking at those cars, I'm trying to make a decision of, can the car itself be salvaged? If it can, is it worth it? Is it a collector car? Is it a rare enough numbers car? Does it have enough to offer as a complete car? If those two are no, then I look at what kind of parts are on the car that I could possibly save. What parts have the redeeming value that I can't just call Auto Metal Direct or Classic Industries in order, but I need off of that car. So when you see me walking around those cars, I'm not just kind of taking in the ambiance, I'm actually doing a mental inventory of what can be saved. You know, these cars were not easy to navigate around. It was, it was rough old timberland that was overgrown. So every step you take, you don't know if you're stepping on something. If you do step on it, are you, are you gonna get, is it rusty? Are you gonna get, what, what do they call that, lock face? Or whatever it is, lock jaw? I don't know, something to do with stepping on something bad, right? <laughs> but looking at the cars and trying to determine what parts are good, these cars are covered in moss. They're covered in dirt, they're covered in debris. So you have to have some experience, number one, in what you're looking at. Number two is just take your time, walk around and slowly inventory everything. A lot of stuff at a glance you just knew was destroyed on them. But again, my job is before I make an offer on that car, what can be saved? Besides just the idea that I'm dragging a couple cars out of the brush, what can I actually save? So going around the cars, I came to the conclusion there really wasn't much that was salvageable. So you get to the front end of the car, the front bumper, the valance, the grill, the header, the openings, all of those things, garbage, rotted. And if they weren't rotted, they were damaged. Go to the back of the car, same thing. Tail lights, plastic is broken, the chrome is pitted, the opening around the body panel is rotted, the rear bumper is rotted and twisted and damaged, as is the rear valance. So now you got nothing on the front, nothing on the back. You go to the sheet metal, the fenders, nothing on those fenders. Both fenders are caved in, both fenders are rotted, both fenders have been ran over with D8 cats for all I know. Same thing on the doors, same thing on the quarter panel, same thing on the roof. No redeeming value on the exterior of the car, move to the interior of the car. Everything in the car was garbage. Console, shifter, seats, steering wheel, dash, even the floor was gone. The interior of the car is interesting. Almost everything was in there. The instrument cluster was missing on the one car. The other car that had no floors in it had nothing in it. But the one I was looking at had the console, the steering column, the seats, all those pieces were in it. The downside is, and this is what I was talking about earlier, they were garbage from being exposed to the elements for however many years. Otherwise, we could have used console pieces. We could have used the shifter for something. But at the end of the day, that interior had a great big goose egg for any value. When I was done looking these cars over, there was very little that could be saved. All the sheet metal was destroyed. All of the interiors were destroyed. Under the hood destroyed, bolt-on parts, everything destroyed. Except the reason I'm sharing this with you now, which is the roof inner structure. 
on both cars was salvageable. That's why I brought all this back. That's why I'm walking you back down memory lane. We are about to save a car because of those two cars. And when people laugh at me and say, why did you go out and buy junk? Why did you pay good money for junk that has nothing on it? Those two parts are why. One of the cars I'm excited about painting is our 1970 Roadrunner convertible. It goes to EV2 Hemi Orange. It's just a different type of car. You know, we don't do a lot of convertibles. I love the black stripes that go on these. So anytime you can change things up a little bit, it's always fun. Sorry, folks, but that is not true. EV2 in a Plymouth lineup is called Tor Red, not Hemi Orange. And I've told Will this multiple times. He should know it by now. So the Tor Red EV2 Roadrunner came to us a couple years ago. It was in pretty rough shape, but we're at the point now we're ready to mask it up and get primer going on it. When the Roadrunner came to us, it was in bad shape. I mean, everything from the firewall back had to be replaced. We did floors, under seat pan, rear frame rails, quarters, rear body panel, all of it needed to be done. This car was actually featured in several episodes a few seasons ago where even the inner rockers were destroyed from rust. The car was just really a Midwest rotten car. And we talked about the reinforcement angle iron that goes inside of the rocker. So in case you guys missed that, that was a really, really neat bit. Because they had to be replaced, we were able to take the rocker off of there and show you what that piece looks like inside. So the piece I'm talking about is right here. This is quarter inch plate steel. It's shaped and mimics the inside of the rocker itself. So it follows the bottom of the rocker up the side and across the top. So you see right here, it goes all the way out to here and then it spot welds down inside here. This being quarter inch plate and it runs all the way from the edge of the rocker here to the very front. You won't see that in a hardtop car. Okay, if you go out to our hardtop, our 1970 Coronet, and take a look at that, you'll see what I'm talking about. It's because we have no roof to hold the car together, Chrysler thought, and rightfully so, it would be a good idea to reinforce the rockers. So that's what these are. I believe that this part is actually available in the parts book. I think you can go back to the original parts book and actually order one of those back in the day if you were to happen to get in a wreck. So we have the other side opened up, and this is ready to get the new inner rocker. That's how we were able to see all of this. We already did the inner rocker front section here, like I said, with the floor. So this piece will go in like this, set something like that. Across the bottom, it'll get spot welded along here. And it'll get plug welded down here. And that will help finish off the reinforcement and, and the strength of that rocker panel. So we're kind of, what we wanted to do because it was so rotten in the main structure is we wanted to do it piece by piece so we didn't lose the overall geometry of the car. Like we have in the past when you blow something completely apart, you can lose things, lose its geometrical shape and so you're fighting that all the time. So in this case, if you just leave it together, it moves it a lot faster through here. You know, from that standpoint, I guess you kind of consider myself a bit of a, uh, a teacher or a, maybe it would be a guru if it was a religious thing. Oh, the bumper oh, literally car. fell off. Okay. Yeah. Now, once those cars got back to town, the first thing we did was we cleaned them. We shared that in an earlier episode. Cleaned all the moss off, got all the junk out of it, threw all the garbage away so we could see what we had. And my hunch, all the way up there in Washington, covered in the swamp, was absolutely right. Very, very little could be used. A few infrastructure pieces besides what I'm looking at, but for the most part, that roof infrastructure, the quarter to wheelhouse and the rear header area that nobody makes, AMD doesn't make it, it was good. So that car was marked as a potential donor to be able to bring another car back to life. About a year ago, I had a gentleman out of Texas reach out to me. Uh, he had a 68 Charger RT, it's a real RT car. He had started doing a lot of the body work on it himself. He can do some work at home, right? But 
like you see at Graveyard Cars, things can grow. It can start out by, I'm just gonna put a trunk floor in it, next thing you know, you're putting half the car on it. That was what happened to him. He was unable to do all of the work, the massive amount of metal work on the car that needed to be done. And like with the cars that we do here, it grew and grew to a point where he wasn't able to do the repairs at home, so he sent it to me. When that car got here, it was more complete than you see right now. We cut some of the outer parts of the quarter panel off and the rear body so we could get it dipped and get everything clean that's inside of there. We knew it all had to be replaced. So the way you see it isn't exactly the way it came to me, but it's not far off from it. So now when you look at the car, everything that's off of it, you can see there's no back window inner structure, I'll call it. It's really part of the quarter inner structure, but if you look at it, there's nothing back there. It's wide open space. The package tray is gone. The opening around the window that the skins would go up against for the quarters that would make up the back window opening, they're completely gone. So that area that is so crucial, not the package tray because they do make that, but everything else they don't make. And that's what we're gonna be using these donor parts for. So as I had mentioned, the pieces that we're gonna be saving off of the donor cars that came out of Washington are these roof reinforcement parts. Here's a great example of how a car that looks like junk can still offer a little something. Those reinforcement pieces are gonna allow us to put this RT together. Now, the whole reason I'm really sharing this with you is this is a major project on this RT that we're doing. We're gonna be replacing almost all of the metal on it, kind of like our 71 Cuda that we did a couple of seasons ago that we built from scratch. We're not building it from scratch, but we're doing a lot of work on it. And I wanted to share every step of that process. Uh, people like it when we show you how things are done on areas that you wouldn't normally see anywhere else or on another show. So that's, that's the whole point behind why I'm taking time now to show you all this stuff. The owner of the vehicle had cut out that back window opening that you see. If you look where I'm pointing there on each side of the window opening, that's where the material's missing from. Those are the areas that they don't make new. Now, I would have also probably cut it out because it was rusty, but I would have kept the pieces as a template and tried to duplicate them. Those parts are gone, so the next best thing we have is to find the donor part and put in there. Those will be saved from the original cars up in Washington and grafted onto this car. You know, when it comes to the paint side of things, obviously I'm very knowledgeable on it. I'm not the metal guy though. I'm not as knowledgeable about the metal, but you know, when you get these cars back, I mean, there's nothing there. And we have saved some cars that even shouldn't have been saved. I've watched Mark do some like really just acts of miracle on what he's done. So I don't, I don't envy these guys at all when it comes to the metal department. I'm not a huge fan of cutting up one car to save another one, but in this case, we've explained it. There really wasn't anything else on the car, especially around this area that was useful for anything. That's why we chose to knock that one in the head. As with any car that we're working on, once we have it disassembled, it goes off to get dipped. That's where we're at on the car right now is getting it sent out, having it chemically dipped, stop all the rust that started on it, neutralize anything that's already there, get all the garbage off of the car. Then we can begin putting it back together again. Our 1970 Roadrunner convertible. This car actually went pretty quickly once we kind of caught our rhythm. We're doing that more so now than ever because we have a great team. You know, after it's primed, we'll start getting it ready, get it blocked down, get our jam work knocked out on it real quick. When I talk about jamming, it's the areas that are hard to get to. The stuff that you gotta paint first before you can put the car together. Underside of the hood, door jams, the underside of the doors, the deck lid, the trunk. All of that stuff that you can't get with those panels on, you get them all done while they're apart. So when you put the car together, it's just a matter of blocking the car down and then doing the final paint. You know, the process is the same, whether it be a jam or the outside of the car. The jams are just as important as the body. I'll still do two coats of sealer if it's a metallic, because if you don't, you have some sand scratches or any imperfection, that metallic's gonna lay in there and it's gonna stand out big time. All the way through, the jams are treated just like the outside of the car, two coats of sealer, your color, your clear. That way, when they open the door, pop the hood, open the trunk, it's like, wow, that looks great, just like the outside. As I was saying, since the interior is black, that means we have to do two-tone on the doors. So it's what I do on the door jams, because it's, kind of the simplest, quickest, and easiest way. The door itself, I'll just single stage the whole entire door jam black. Let that dry overnight. Come in the next day, run my tape line right where that weather strip goes, then mask off the black, then I'll shoot the orange. And yes, it needs to be perfect, but when, you know, when you're training somebody like Noah, 
If he has a little bleed through onto that black, it doesn't matter because when you unmask it, you can just wipe it off with some solvent. To where if I did it all in base coat, man, if that orange bleeds on that black, you got to go back and do the black. It has to be masked tight, otherwise it'll kind of ghost or kind of leak in there. So what that means is if that black is not taped off good enough, when you go to spray your orange, it'll hit the black. That's why I do it in a single stage. So if there is any bleed through or ghosting, you can just wipe it off with solvent. Mark likes to beat people down. I don't. Our training styles are completely different. I build them up, he tears them down. That's his way. I have my guys, I have my team. We do it my way. You know, I like to take the time and train my guys, teach them, every one of them that's worth teaching. Some just aren't. <laughs> I mean, that's the truth of it. But I do build them up. Noah has been by my side for almost two years now. He does a great job. I trust him. Same thing with Michael. I build these guys up. I don't tear them down. If they make a mistake, we learn together. I show them and we move forward. So it's nice to be at that point where I can just let Noah take over. You know, for me as an employer and a teacher myself, as I mentioned, it's nice to see that I have taught my people how to teach others. And so it, that goes on and on. Right now, Will has a great helper because he's taken my teaching skills and utilized them to be able to teach somebody else. So when you see Will being able to walk away like he is, I think uh, it's only because he has put himself in the same position I have. So all in all, he's a really good teacher. Will said your, your teaching skills suck. Will said mine did, that mine sucked. That's a cruel thing to say. I was being nice. He's the worst teacher in the world. You, you go down there, he doesn't do anything. I was being nice. I'm not now. <laughs> I taught him, so what are you gonna say about that? And then you go in there and, you, and when he starts to teach people, he's on his phone, I love you, I love you, I love you, back and forth to his girlfriend and, and taking selfies while he's trying to teach somebody. He's a, he sucks, not me. <laughs> I'm a good teacher. So once the orange is done, we don't have to unmask anything because the black's already been done. So we get our base coat done on the door, then we just go ahead and go right to clear. And before that clear sets up, we unmask the whole thing so that way the clear doesn't bridge over to the tape. Unmask it, let it dry, and it's done. Several seasons ago, we finished the restoration on this beautiful 1970 Dodge Challenger RT. This car is a factory 440, four-speed 354 Dana in Plum Crazy. True or false, the only thing we added to that car that it did not start life with was the Rally Instrument Cluster. If you think you remember, shout out the answer. Stay tuned after the break. I'll let you know how you did. All right, folks, how'd you do on that one? On our beautiful little one of 916 Challenger RTs, did we add the Rally Instrument Cluster? If you said that's true, you were wrong. It had a Rally Instrument Cluster, but all Challenger RTs had a Rally Instrument Cluster. There you go. We added nothing to this car. How you see it in the video is exactly how that car started life. This was one of the most beautiful and my favorite cars that we've done in Graveyard Cars history. And here's a piece of trivia. I actually bought that car in 1987 and sold it to a gentleman who sold it to Chips. So technically, I'm the one that brought that car back to life. Before we can hang the doors on, we gotta get the car itself jammed. Underneath the hood, the door jams and rockers themselves. All that stuff's gotta be painted first and then the doors and hood and whatnot can go on the car. Mark talks about how great his teaching skills are. I couldn't disagree more. I've spent 25, 26 years by his side. So I, if anyone's gonna know, Mark, it's me. And he's not a good teacher. And in fact, don't tell him, but one of those guys he taught is still here. I've been working for Mark since the 80s. Um, he's not a good teacher. You know, he calls me a butcher. I, I don't like that term. Will's a lot nicer, a lot better at teaching me. I paid an engine compartment at one time. He said it looked like Stevie Wonder did it. So I don't understand what a musician has to do with painting cars. But 
yeah, Will has been a far better teacher than Mark ever has. Now that we have the donor car cleaned up inside, I want to show you what parts we're going to be harvesting off of it for our 68 Charger, this is the Dipper, and how we're going to do that. This is very, very intricate work. If you cut into a donor part, you could potentially ruin it or add extra work for yourself. So dissecting and harvesting a donor part that is underneath layers of other metal, it's very, very tedious work. This happens to be a 68 charger. It doesn't need to be to do what we're doing. We could use a 68 to 70. The inner structure pieces are the same. We just happen to have a 68. Where you see these markings at right now, what the body man's gonna do is he's gonna cut on that line, but he's only removing the outer skin. There's a whole bunch of reinforcements inside besides the pieces we're looking to harvest, but you gotta get access to them. So step one is clean the car up so you can see what you're doing. Step two is mark out where you want to make your cuts and get the meat out of the way so you can get in there and surgically remove the parts that you want. So right now he's getting ready to cut all of this out. Once he has that out, I can walk you guys inside and show you exactly what it looks like and how we do the next step. Well, I'm really happy in the mechanical department. I cannot believe what Shane and other of these body guys can do to put these cars back together. I would never imagine that cars like this Charger could be saved. I've known Shane for years. Went to high school together. We spent actually a lot of time together. Came into the industry at the same time almost, and he just went for the body side and I went for the paint side. And we've worked together a couple times for Mark and then kind of went our own direction. So it's cool to now at this stage in our life and being 42 years old, that we're back together again. Uh, we have a lot of great memories of stuff we did when we were kids, we laugh and joke about it. But watching him do what he does, he's a very talented guy. He takes these cars that are at nothing and he's very, very meticulous. He's fit and everything, making sure everything is just perfect. And he's just a great asset to the team. So what Shane's doing now is he's cutting apart this charger. He's using an air hammer with the metal tip. He's getting the big sections removed first to give himself room to work, to go back in there and do more intricate detail stuff. And the nice thing about the air hammer, there's no smoke, there's no sparks, there's no heat. It's just loud. I can't believe how Shane can take a impact tool like we use in the mechanic shop and he uses it to cut these cars apart and I can't believe what a good job he does. So knowing that the inner structure pieces we need are underneath the roof skin, underneath the quarters, underneath the Dutchman panel area, we have to remove those to gain access to the parts that we want to harvest. That means he is going to cut out the quarter panels, the roof skin, the Dutchman panel in big chunks. They're garbage. They're not usable pieces, so don't worry, folks. We're not ruining a good car. They're just peeling all the layers of the onion off so we can get to those parts and save them and not damage them. It's funny when he's actually cutting through previous repairs and he'll hit a chunk of, chunk of Bondo or anything for that matter. It just shoots it everywhere. Now where the beam goes across the inner structure and the quarter panel lays over it, that's right against the bottom of that quarter skin. That's why he is switching over to a cutoff wheel versus the big zip rattle gun that's gonna go through there. You have to be cautious and not damage the pieces that you want to reuse. You know, masking these cars up for final paint is super critical. Because I've done the jam work, the, everything's painted and pretty, it's super important to really take your time and do a nice, tight mask. Therefore, overspray doesn't get all over everything, everything that you've done and ruined it. And there's nothing Mark hates more than seeing overspray all over a car. I masked up a car once. It, it looked beautiful, honestly. Mark came around, tore it all off, said it looked like Ray Charles did it. And then he talked about wiping his ass with it. I mean, talk about tough learning, right? So once the car is all masked up, wiped down, 
and tacked off. At that point, I'm ready to put my sealer on. I'll do two coats of that. It's the DCS 2005 gray sealer. It'll fill all those little tiny imperfections. Mark liked to think he was a professional pool player. He would take his time and line up the shot, look at it from different angles. I get tired of waiting for him, so I just kind of stand there with my hands on the table and not thinking. And when my fingers would go over the edge, he would see that as an opportunity to smash him. And then he would laugh when he'd hurt me. Oh, I don't know. It's sick. It's sick, I tell you. Yeah, I'm tired of Royals fibs about this thing. Here, here's what exactly happened with the pool table. This is very simple. My Uncle Doug gave me a pool table that I had in my carport. Well, Royal had ridden his bull taco, which used to be my bull taco 125%, over to my house. So we're shooting a little bit of stick out there, right? We got our big glugs going on. And Royal's playing a game, man. He's trying to distract me. I'm trying to make a very careful shot, and he's got his fingers hanging over the edge of the rails. So I decided to myself, well, you know what? It's if, if a dog pees on your carpet, swat it with a newspaper, right? So I, I acted like I was shooting my, my shot, but I was really lining up to drive that cue ball into his fingertips, and I did, and it hurt. It instantly turned it black, and he screamed and called me dirty names because he liked to cuss back then. He had a rage problem. Everybody was talking about it. And then he hawks a loogie on my pool table. So when I'm taking my time to line up my shot, I accidentally drooled on his pool table. I I was concentrating on my shot, man. That was a winning shot. I was going to beat him, maybe for the second time. He kept telling me I spit on it. No, I didn't spit on it. So I drooled on it. There's a difference. Well, it ends his fighting words. Now, we was, we was probably 14 years old. So next time he smashed my fingers, he said that was for spitting on his pool table. I said, by God, I'll spit on your pool table. So I did. So he hawks a big old white stringer on my pool table. I take off after him. Then he chased me down the alley. He couldn't run. You know, criminals are faster. I have no reason to run. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Anyway, he takes off looking down the alley as fast as he can. I'm going, I'm going. I'm mad. I'm I just see red. As he starts gaining distance, I stopped and grabbed a handful of gravel, and I threw that, hoping, well, you know, if I could knock him out or hit him in the back of the head and knock him down and slow him down, then I could go up and I could beat the tar out of him. By the time he stopped and picked up rocks, I was already out of range. He didn't have a chance. Of course, I was laughing. I ran. I ran off. Well, none of the damn rocks hit. So he got away. He was so filled with rage. I figured I'd better give him a couple days to cool down. So I, that, that was it. That sent me over the edge. I came back to the house. There was his motorcycle leaning up against the back of my shed. And right next to it was one of the tools I used to make money called a sickle. A sling blade. Some people call it a Kaiser blade. I call it a sling blade. Mm -hmm. I pick up the sling blade and I start whacking on that motorcycle seat until it's nothing but spaghetti. Came back a couple days later and he goes, here, I got something to show you. So he takes me out back and shows me the, the motorcycle seat. He asked what happened to the seat and I told him in the beginning I had no idea. I thought maybe a cat sharpened its claws on it or something. And I said, what'd you do that for? He said, you ran. Well, yeah, you were gonna hit me and I was laughing too hard. I couldn't fight. I can't fight when I'm laughing. Obviously, domestic cats can't shred it all the way down to the metal pan. So he knew what had happened and whatever reason he holds that against me to this day. He's childish, I tell you. Here's a piece of advice. Don't spit on another man's pool table. <laughs> He's a childish man. You know, EV2 Hemi Orange is actually a very transparent color. And to a red. <laughs> Go ahead. Why, why are you here? I am here because I do not trust you any longer. What? Audience, you notice that we've changed positions. What has happened? We've, you don't trust me? We've changed the camera. No, you said I was a bad teacher. You're the worst teacher God ever created. I agree. OK. Then why would you call me that? Because you're, you're, you're not good either. I'm Tony is the right only here. one that is a good teacher. Tony is a terrible teacher. All he's thinking about is food all the time. He's, he knows no, a he lot, doesn't but he's degrade. Not a good he actually takes the time to, 
to explain That's all he problem. does. I call him up and say, hey, do you not need No, you, you call him up and you're like, hey, fat. Beep. That's not true. I'll call him up and I'll say something like, hey, Tony, do you know if the, whatever it is, uh, a 71 E-body with a A34, should that have 11 inch drums? Uh, we talked about that there before. Uh, I don't know why you don't wear this well, up I call there. Tony. It's on my flash drive, that there. Just, just stop do your it. thing. You know what? I'm this done. Is stupid. Yes. Good. Thank you. No. Shoot. I'll be quiet. Next question. So, uh, <clears throat> Tor Red, you know, it is a transparent color. You're looking six, seven, eight coats to cover. That's why I do a spray out card first, just to get the exact amount before I actually even go onto the car. And then once I do, the booth is a controlled environment as far as temperature goes. So I'll set the booth about 65. So by the time I get around the whole entire car, it's almost time to go again. So you get that first coat on, and then it's the same process all the way through to seven or eight. Is it coats? Yeah. You just keep shrugging, so I don't know. No, I'm not doing it. Seven anything. or eight coats. Um, let that flash good half hour. Then I tack it, and then I'll go back in and then start my clear coat process. You have to top coat it within 24 hours. Otherwise, if you wait too long, that base coat kind of closes off, and the clear coat, clear coat won't stick to it. It'll peel. Yeah. So. Next question. So a lot of circumstances, these cars are too big to have a hood and deck lid in there with the car. So I'll do them separately. The air pressure, I have a digital little gauge on the back of my gun, so I know the air pressure is good. I, however many coats I put on the car, I put on the hood and the deck lid when I go to do them. So I've never had a problem actually painting them separately at all. No, I just remember some of the repaints we've done. But go ahead. I'm not so here. No, I'm just playing with you. He does a good job matching the paint. I don't miss painting the cars right now. With my carpal tunnel, it's it's hard, you know, holding that gun for hour after hour at a time and coat after coat. So I don't miss it, and I'm glad that you have a good helper that can help you. I'm, I'm glad you're where you're at on it. Oh, thank you. Noah does a good job. You trained him well. Thank you. Wow. Thank you very much. And I'm a good painter. Yeah, you're a great painter. Thank you. So watching you paint those cars is nice for me because Overall, your pattern's very much like mine. We spend a lot of time together. You're doing the 50% overlap. I think sometimes they want even more than that, but I think the 50% is fine as long as you get the number of coats on there. So as I watch you walk around that car, I can see one coat, two coat, three coat. The best part for me is watching the color cover the sealer and begin right. to take its shape. That's when it really becomes a car. That's when you can start to see all of the style lines that make it so beautiful. The world-famous Phantom Cuda left the factory with a 446-barrel engine, a four-speed manual transmission, 354 Dana, and an N96 shaker hood. How many of these cars were made? Was it 18, 108, 1,008? If you think you know the answer, stay tuned after the break. I'll let you know how you did. All right, ghouls, welcome back. Is that not a gorgeous car? EV2 Tour Red 446 Barrel Shaker. How many of those cars were built? If you said 18, you were wrong. You are close. There were only 108 of those cars ever made with a 446 barrel and a four-speed manual transmission. If you add the color, the shaker hood, and the rest of the options, it may very well be one of only one ever made. We are painting our 1970 Roadrunner. It is Hemi Orange. It's convertible. Pretty simple car to shoot. There's no, there's no roof, there's no pillars, just a longer car. We don't have it on a Whirly because we want to make sure we maintain the... So here's a great example. I spent all this time trying to get my color done, ready to move on to the clear, and then Mark's normal routine, whatever he can to get himself on TV, even more than he is already, 
comes in with the dog, comes in with the hat. And stop you right there. That is not exactly what happened. I was trying to get your attention, you dumb. I was trying to get his attention. For what? Because there were problems in the base coat that I could see. What's a dog going to do with a Mopar hat? The dog is something where you go to the ear with a point and the heart with a story. There's a method behind my teaching. <laughs> I've told you that. You say I suck as a teacher, but all of those things have added up. Does the car look good? Yeah, because I did it. Okay. So when you're doing your interview, I notice that you like to keep the attention on you. And you say you block me out. But maybe, just maybe, there's something actually important being said behind you. Like moonwalking in a stupid hat? Has a point to it, absolutely. Zero. Michael Jackson. Well, I don't. This is know exhausting. About that. What about the when I was walking down the stairs and it looked like I disappeared? Those are all training. No, okay? they're not. It, yeah, they are. They have a point. This is a to great them. time to just walk off set. I believe it was Professor Morris. But I'm Morris not going to do that Massey because I know there's said, more questions that need to be answered. Go to the, the people with at home. Heart with story. It's Next fine. question. What you don't understand is I'm trying to help you be a better painter. Okay, I'm, I'm taking my time. I'm trying to make you be a better painter, a better man, a better husband, a better father. Oh my God. I am taking, Are you doing this right now? I'm taking you under my wing in these situations. And I'm saying to you, it's okay to be you. It's okay. It's okay to be a little silly sometimes. You walk around so serious and so balled up I really worry with your excessive weight, your blood pressure, and your cholesterol that you're not going to be painting much longer. The yes. only thing you're going to be painting is the inside of a casket I... from six feet below. Did he hire a new painter? For me, it would just be nice when I make so many efforts to be a good instructor and to help make you a better person, to get a call from your wife, get a call from your kids saying, hey, thanks for making Pops a better dad. Thanks for making him a better mm -hmm. husband. Denise. She's... God rest She's soul. alive. Call me up and say, Mark, thank you so much for taking care of my son. You've no, really yeah, made you a difference think, oh, in the family. Yes, you have taken care of me. Made me a better husband? No. Better father? No. But you have taken care of me. I just think at the end of the day, some of the things that I do should be held up more as a example of what to do versus what not to do. What is happening? Someday, when I've shuffled from this mortal coil and am no longer, I hope that you reflect back on these days and say, he made me be a better person. Set me up on that mantle. Put me up there. It's okay. And say, you done all right by me, boss. You done all right by me. I mean, all right, yeah. I, you want to be on my mantle? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Some of my remains. And I don't want the barbecued ones from the cremation. I want, like, maybe my <laughs> there. You want your cremated oh, I'm not going to cremate it. I want it cut off before I get cremated, and I want it up there so you can remember me. How would I even... That's weird. How about... <laughs> so my way of remembering you is your <laughs> on my mantle? You say tomato, I say tomato. I don't... So once we had the outer skins off of this car, the roof skin, the quarter skins, and the Dutchman panel, I was in a position where we could see all of the inner structure pieces that we needed to harvest. The parts that we're looking to save right here are the roof inner structure to the wheelhouse and the quarter inner structure to the quarter panel itself. These are the pieces that aren't being made. Now, just a quick side note, AMD did just announce that they are making these pieces for the E-body. That's right. Remember back a couple seasons ago, we talked about that they weren't being made. Now they're making them. They called me up and they gave me a personal thank you and said, thank you for helping us be a better company. It's always something. They never called me and said no, that. No, they didn't. No, but they certainly made a part I said was needed, didn't they? Okay. Now the rear header itself at the opening at the top of the back glass, that is being made by AMD, as are the side rails being made. The roof skin, the quarters, the Dutchman, all that we can get brand new. You know, it's funny when they took that Dutchman panel off of there, that's a great example of previous sins that we've talked about. 
We see it all the time, garbage after garbage. So somebody on this Dutchman really butchered it. Apparently it was rusted out. And instead of just replacing the Dutchman panel, which is what I would have done, they took pieces of a refrigerator, the outer skin of a refrigerator, which are aluminum, pop riveted them to the Dutchman panel and then just caved it in and smeared Bondo over the top of it. So if you look carefully, you'll see little blue dots at all of the spot weld points that we need to drill out. These are the areas that need to come loose from the rest of the structure to give us the harvested parts that we need. So everywhere that there's a blue dot, at the wheelhouse, at the back opening, at the Dutchman, all these areas need to have the spot welds drilled out. Now the reason we're drilling out spot welds is the same reason we do whenever we harvest a part. We want to be able to put this piece back in a car in the same factory fashion. So we have to dissect it from the other pieces to do that. Now this one's a little bit more intricate because we want to put on that quarter reinforcement to wheelhouse area along with a section of the upper piece and the side header. We figured if we can put that in as one unit, our geometry will be automatically established because it's a good part and it'll save a lot of cutting and trimming. Once the body man has established what spot welds need to be drilled out, it's much easier to have full access to those. There's a lot of drilling. So he will cut these pieces out in a larger chunk, much like taking off the roof and the outer quarter skins. He's going to take a torch and blow out larger footprint than these parts. Harvest that part off of there, flip it upside down and begin drilling out spot welds at a nice easy access height to get to. Now that the major piece that we're gonna be using is cut out, they'll take it over to the bench, drill out all the spot welds, clean it up, do the same thing to the car that is going to receive it. Next time you see that car, we'll be putting that roof infrastructure on. So if I can explain this without being interrupted. If you didn't lie, go ahead. Once the base coat is completely flashed off and we're ready to get to the clear, I'll start the clear coat process. Tack off the car, make sure you get any dust, little particles off it that may be there. I grab our PPG DCU 2021 clear. I do three coats of that. I'll put one coat over the whole entire car. It kind of depends on the temperature and the pace that you set. About a half hour, I'll go in and do a whole another coat another half hour, do my third and final coat, and that gives you enough material to cut and buff, and then that car will sit for a week or two, and then I'll kick it out to Noah, my helper, and he'll get the cut and buff done, then it's right over to assembly. It just comes down to the fact that we both know that I'm a better teacher than you. It doesn't <laughs> need to upset you. It's not a competition. I'm just a better teacher than you. Okay. Sounds good. Yeah, I worked with Will back in the 80s. He was the worst teacher ever. Really sucked. Will sucks.